Hello, everyone. My great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual program, Searsville before Stanford, History and Archaeology in the Upper San Francisco Watershed, hosted and organized by the Stanford Historical Society. I'm Leslie Kim, and I'm Vice President of the Historical Society, as well as co-chair of the program committee. Um, I want to thank uh, those of you who are members of the Historical Society for your support, which makes these webinars and our other important historical resources possible. As our members know, the Society is an independent, volunteer-driven organization devoted to the scholarship and sharing of Stanford history, and we rely heavily on membership dues and donations to keep our work going and to provide content such as what you'll be hearing today. Anyone who's interested can join the Society, which you can do on our website, historicalsociety.stanford.edu. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Laura Jones. Laura, who earned her master's and PhD from Stanford, is the university's director of heritage services and university archaeologist, responsible for stewardship of Stanford's nearly 100 archaeological sites and 200 historic buildings. Her archaeological experience includes serving as director of a number of major excavations of prehistoric occupation and cemetery sites in the San Francisco Bay Area where she works closely with the indigenous Moekma Ohlone tribe. Laura served as senior scholar and director of community programs at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and is the co-author of a major study of doctoral education, The Formation of Scholars, published in 2007. We were lucky enough to have her serve as the Stanford Historical Society's 21st president from 2016 to 2019. It's my great pleasure to introduce her today. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Leslie. It's really a pleasure to be back with you uh, here at the Stanford Historical Society. Let me open my slides. So I'm here to talk to you about some work in progress that we've been doing here in Heritage Services on Searsville before Stanford. And what I'm going to talk about today is the about you know 8,000 year period um, between the ancestral Ohlone occupation up until really the 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 sort of peak of the town of Searsville, um, the lumber boom town that developed uh, near Searsville, what we now think of as Searsville Lake. So I'm going to be going through uh, about 8,000 years of history, and, that, and we're going to end at about 1870 um, for today's talk. There's also a very rich history, of course, um, after 1870 that we could go into at a future program, but that's about where we are. I, I would take questions about other things as well. Um, this particular image on the left was a partnership that we did with SESTA, the Center for Spatial uh, Analysis here at Stanford, where we reconstructed the landscape at approximately 1800 in the Searsville Lake area. And we'll talk more about that reconstructive process and about reimagining what that landscape was like in a few minutes. This work, I'm a Stanford staff member. Um, in land buildings and real estate. And I support Stanford's uh, capital projects, among other things. Um, and right now, this project is in support of the Searsville Watershed Restoration Project, which is the university's attempt, uh, its proposal, in fact, to restore fish passage past the Searsville Dam into the upper watershed. And so on the left, you see a picture of the current state of the reservoir. Um, which is filling up with silt. And so you'll see that bright green at the bottom of the screen is the sediment delta, the, the area that used to be open water and is now a dense jungle of vegetation. Um, all of that gets removed, a hole goes into the dam uh, and the five creeks that flowed into the reservoir, their channels are restored. And you see that on the right. This is obviously a very big civil engineering project um, and it has a cascading series of associated projects downstream. So the study area is very large um, and there's a very large team uh, working on the project. There are approximately as many biologists as engineers. Um, and then uh, I'm doing the, the cultural resources and archeological work for this together with my team. The context of a big, of a giant civil engineering project like that, a, a biological restoration project um, requires synthesizing decades of historic and archaeological research um, to support the, the permit and evaluation process. And that's what we're going to talk about today, that how do we synthesize all the information we have and make good judgments um, about what our priorities are. Um, the project is subject to public review and comment and public agency approvals. So there will be meetings 
open to the public that you could attend and watch um, where the project is described and its goals and its priorities and its potential impacts. And so if you're really interested um, in the reservoir, uh, I, I would encourage you to sign up. Um, there is a Searsville website that you can get to and sign up to be uh, informed about additional meetings. Um, the goal really from a stewardship point of view, so there's a project permitting point of view and there's a long-term stewardship point of view, is to identify what the significant sites are. You know, Tony Bernoski from Jasper Ridge sent me a picture of a bottle yesterday that the goats found while, while browsing the chaparral for fire control. And um, I said, Tony, see if you can leave it there another hundred years, right? But I'm not sure whether the, the, the twist off malt liquor bottle is really a significant site, right? So part of what we're going to be talking about today is how do we decide, you know, what, what the significant stories are, what the important themes are. Um, and then I ask you to understand that some, inf some information is confidential under state law to protect archaeological sites from looting, which, which is a problem in our watershed, um, and uh, in respect of tribal recommendations. Um, so there, there are fewer detailed maps in here than you might expect. Um, and the reason is to try to protect those locations from advertent or inadvertent harm. Um, another theme that we had, and I was so excited to see that we have some Stanford students who have founded this new nonprofit initiative, Diversify Our Narrative. Diversify Our Narrative is about creating better, richer, more diverse educational and historical content in K-12 schools nationwide. Um, and I hope we're doing our part here at Stanford to diversify our narrative about Stanford history um, and also to think about if, if there happen to be any teachers out there watching, how do we translate this research and our content um, into curriculum for local schools as well? Be happy to hear it from you if you, if you have ideas about that. And now it, it, as I really get into the content here, I think it's really important um, to pause for a moment and acknowledge the first people. Um, you see here some of my friends um, from the Moak Maloney tribe, um, the indigenous people of the Bay Area, um, here for over 9,000 years, um, great friends and supporters of our work and of Stanford's work and of Jasper Ridge's mission. Um, and I just want to acknowledge how important their support is both for our stewardship um, and for our knowledge. There are also, you may, you may learn um, in the Bay Area, other Ohlone families and, and Ohlone organizations um, that, that are not necessarily formal tribes um, or, or aren't as local to our area. Um, but these are the relatives of the Moak Maloney and I want to acknowledge um, that they're out there in the community and that we respect their contributions and their heritage as well. So let's take the, let's step back and take an overview. What are we gonna talk about today? Well, here's my timeline. And you can see, we're gonna talk about ancestral Ohlone settlements. And the reason we're calling these ancestral Ohlone settlements is that we've discovered over time that indigenous people don't like to be defined as uh, in reference to colonialism, right? So we were calling them pre-colonial for a while, but then it's, it, they're still being defined in reference to, to colonialism or that really don't like prehistoric and I can understand why um, because their, their presence and contributions extend um, all the way up into, into, our, into our own modern lives. So we're now calling these ancestral settlements um, to respect the terminology, in fact, that indigenous people use about their ancestors. Um, our oldest radiocarbon dates in the San Francisco watershed um, date to uh, about 7,000 BC. These are not the oldest radiocarbon dates in the Bay Area, um, which can go to 11 to 12,000 BC. Um, and in fact, the oldest sites are believed to be submerged under the bay um, and under the coastal shelf. So uh, most archaeologists believe that their native Californians um, have occupied the Bay Area for at least 15,000 years um, and possibly much longer. Um, here in the watershed, we'll talk more about this in a minute, but this is, this is 9,000 years um, of survival and persistence and thriving um, societies in the Bay Area. Um, it's a relatively short period, right? The Spanish colonial era at 55 years, the Mexican colonial era at 26 years, and the early American colonial era that we'll talk about at 22 years. Um, they get a little outsized attention in history books because they're more visibly present and documented. 
Um, but we should never lose sight of the fact of that sort of overwhelming span um, of human occupation here in the Bay Area by indigenous people. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we've learned from our archeology span here at Stanford, um, uh, many projects over the years. Uh, we have continuous occupation in the San Francisco watershed um, since 7,000 BC. Um, we certainly see culture change in that time period, um, but we see no population replacement for nine millennia. Um, there, are, there are parts of California and parts of the world where you can see one group of people moving into an area and then leaving or being pushed out by another group. Um, we see continuous occupation by the ancestors of Mwak Maloney and their, and their related groups um, for nine millennia. Um, at least in some of the, the, the upper watershed and the middle watershed, the villages that Stanford has done a lot of work on, we see year round occupation. So the, the view that some people used to have that um, these kinds of complex hunter gatherers would move seasonally to wherever the most productive um, harvesting opportunities were, does not appear to have been borne out by archeological data. So they were living year round um, in these village sites. The uplands in areas like Searsville and the Santa Cruz Mountains um, date later than the Bay Shore and Middle Elevation. Um, we're not, we, we don't know how to explain this yet, but um, it, it appears that people, as population density and population numbers increased, people may have been moved upstream. It, it may also be an adaptation to climate fluctuation. Um, communities, uh, uh, occupation sites, villages were located along freshwater streams and estuaries. Because of course water is life. And so water is gonna be a key element in our story in all of these time periods. Um, but for the ancestral Ohlone, water is absolutely essential, right? Um, they can carry water in waterproof baskets, but, but it's heavy and you're not moving it very far. So they're, they're economic and social and family lives are focused on freshwater streams. Um, and their transportation network is dominated by the San Francisco Bay. And so water is an extremely important element in talking about um, uh, their lifeways and in talking about their social relationships. Um, the other, we'll, we'll talk more about this in a minute. Here's a reconstruction that Sesta did with me early on. Um, another thing to know about water is to think about climate and climate change. And so on the left, we see the valley that, that was later flooded by Searsville Lake reconstructed to about 1800 with cold, wet weather. And on the right, we see it with hot, dry weather. And the only purpose of this, don't worry too much about what the different plant communities are in these photos, is just to talk about how um, uh, how much fluctuation there has always been in our climate. Um, uh, we had the, the medieval climatic anomaly and how, uh, how these complex hunter-gatherer people had to adapt to that. And we'll talk more about what our research shows about how they, how they responded to this type of unpredictability in rainfall and the long droughts and the long cold periods that they faced over those 9,000 years. Uh, here they are on a boat on the bay, 1830. Um, you see a couple of uh, Ohlone men paddling a woman across the bay. Um, the, the Ohlone were here before the bay, um, before the bay flooded, um, but the bay became a central feature of their political and social landscape. And we'll talk more about that here just in a minute. We, we talk about what we've learned about ancestral Ohlone economics. So um, what we've discovered in our, by going to conferences and reviewing and sharing and publishing, with other California archeologists is that there are very local responses um, to conditions that are based in part on geography and based in part on access to key resources. Um, you see in some places what we call resource intensification. And so in, for example, the Central Valley, um, what, we, what we see over time as populations of native Californians increased is we see a growing reliance on acorns, deer, um, and certain fish species. Um, and the, and the, the middens and the kitchens and the fireplaces and the hearths and the ovens are full of acorn uh, and fish and deer. Um, and a hypothesis developing that this was going to support, that these highly predictable, highly productive resources were going to, was what was supporting higher population density. 
Um, what we discovered in our research here in San Francisco is that instead, what we see is resource breadth. Is that we see, so instead of having three, three things for dinner, or that's the wrong phrase, three things in your refrigerator, um, the Ohlone had 60, right? And they had that over time and they were supporting higher population densities. So they were choosing not to specialize. And that's a, um, and that's a very interesting choice. Um, and personally, I think it's a very interesting choice. And I encourage you to go home and think about how many, how many taxa are in your refrigerator. I didn't get up to 60 without counting my spice cabinet. Um, the, and what, this, what these different choices are showing us is the geographic and temporal complexity of adapting to changes in climate, changes in landscape, changes in elevation um, over this incredibly long time period. Um, the ancestral Ohlone and most California groups were in fact both sedentary and mobile. And what do I mean by that? They are, they have, they have fixed, they have fixed home territories in which they have rights um, to gather and collect materials. They're living in villages year round. They're also highly mobile in the sense that they are also traveling on foot and in boats um, to collect special resources that they want. Um, to trade, to intermarry. And so there's a great deal actually of travel going on um, uh, during this time period um, and a great deal of intermarriage and intermingling and intercultural behavior. Um, most Ohlone villages, uh, people would have been multilingual. They would have been speaking two or three different languages. Um, so it's a very complex and very mobile system. Um, and at the same time, people are not following herds of of buffalo around, they're 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 not what's called transhuman. They're 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 in fixed locations for thousands and thousands of years. Um, this kind of fixed uh, settlement and high population density then can lead to the development of social stratification, and where you're where where you need to exercise social control and systems of of, of social order among large groups of people, and that is often often inherited. Um, you start to see inherited wealth, inherited leadership patterns in some parts of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and this is tied to the control of key natural resources, prestige goods, trade networks, um, important strategic locations. Um, and it's geographically concentrated at larger rivers uh, and deltas. Um, when I talk about prestige goods, the economy in California runs on certain types of trade goods that create wealth and prestige. You'll see, you'll see a beautiful obsidian point on the left, obsidian found in the Sierra Nevada um, and in the Napa Sonoma areas. Um, there's, no, there's no natural obsidian here uh, in the San Francisco Bay. Um, you see abalone in the middle. Um, while the, the ancestral Ohlone living in, in the Searsville area could have walked over to the coast to gather shellfish, their cousins at the coast were, were unlikely to allow them to harvest large amounts of abalone um, because abalone is a source of, of, uh, of ornaments that were traded um, as a currency. Um, and then on the right, you see a beautiful um, ohlone basket decorated with, uh, I think these are clam shell beads, but they also made olivella shell beads. These types of shells that were used to create these tiny little beads um, were also a sort, an enormous source of wealth I mean, we're, and those source sites, the beaches where these shells are found, were also very carefully controlled. Um, the, the Ohlone on the bay side of the Santa Cruz Mountains um, didn't have access to these resources, um, except through trade. And so you would have to, through your own um, skilled craftsmanship or craftspersonship as a basket weaver or a, a arrowhead maker or a singer or a dancer, um, uh, you would have to create something else that you could trade um, for this type of prestige good. Um, the other issue, you know, with the major fisheries. So the, the, the wealthiest communities um, in indigenous San Francisco Bay Area um, were located proximal to these major fisheries. So the really, the, uh, here we have the Delta smelt on the left, uh, running up the Sacramento River Delta and schooling sometimes down into the South Bay. Uh, the sturgeon uh, on the upper right, and then the steelhead salmon on the bottom. Um, you know, while uh, there certainly were and are steelhead in San Francisco Creek, 
our, our, the archaeological evidence um, is, is not showing an abundant um, steelhead run. Um, their bones are relatively rare in middens um, in San Francisco Creek. And so these are the really big um, uh, foodstuffs. This is the kind of fish that you can smoke and dry and trade. And, and it, it's tremendously good food. And the, the Ohlone in the South Bay don't have as much access to this as some of the other communities um, in the Delta and also at the really giant estuary um, down in the South Bay of the Coyote and Guadalupe rivers. So in the upper watershed, we're talking about a very local area here. You have a situation of what, what I described as compressed vertical diversity, where the distance from the bay to the, to the uh, you know, to the summit of the Santa Cruz Mountains is not very far. I think it's something like 10 miles, right? And so that creates a really a wide variety of ecological niches and a tremendous amount of natural diversity. I think this makes breadth um, a smart choice for them. Um, and, it, and it's definitely the choice they made. You've also got limited access to these prestige resources. I'm trying to think, what, what, what have they got up here in the uplands that nobody else wants and that they all want to trade you beautiful obsidian for? Um, you, maybe some fur, maybe you could trap some fur, maybe you could make a beautiful basket um, and trade it. But they're, uh, what we find of populations here in the upper watershed is that we don't find a lot of extremely wealthy people up here. Um, and so it's, the hinter, it, it, it's a hinterland, um, as my colleague Mike Wilcox calls it. Um, this is, you know, while we might think of Portola Valley and Woodside as extremely desirable places to live today um, in the homes of some of our more wealthy and successful residents, um, that was not true um, 5,000 or 10,000 years ago. Um, the power base was out at the bay and at these estuaries and up in the delta. Um, and these were, you know, relatively isolated communities um, uh, living up here in the mountains. That, that type of isolation and that lack of wealth resources, though, really led to a very egalitarian and small scale um, politics um, on the peninsula. And so you see less inherited wealth, you see, um, you sometimes see women as leaders, um, you don't see as much inherited leadership, you see very small communities um, as political units. Uh, and this is less true in some other parts of, of California and of the Bay Area, where there is more social stratification, more wealth, um, more competition for some of these extremely important resources and, and, and frankly, more intergroup violence, which we almost never see here on the peninsula. Um, this is a beautiful photo of, of Mount Umina, um, looking out towards uh, Santa Cruz. Um, just a, just a, a photo to show us partly what that, what that compressed vertical um, diversity looks like. And also the really, the, the importance um, in uh, ancestral Ohlone cosmology of these high places. So the Mount Amunum is, a, is an Ohlone sacred site. So it was Mount Diablo. Um, and so high, high places um, uh, are particularly important. Um, and you know, within the Searsville area, uh, certainly the summit, summit of the mountains and certain other uh, peaks like, like Coyote Rocks and Jasper Ridge, um, uh, I mean, rattlesnake rocks would also have been an important site. Um, here we just have a photo of some Ohlone food diversity. Um, I hope all of you uh, can understand why we enjoy um, diversity. You can see some miner's lettuce here and some uh, hazelnut and some quail eggs and uh, some seeds. Um, really an astonishing amount of delicious food out there um, if you know where to look for it. So now we're going to shift, right, um, from that ancestral Ohlone period to the period um, of colonial contact. And so the first colonial contact, other than Cabrillo and some, some you know, early explorers sailing along the coast, um, you know, was, arrived in the 1760s um, in our local area. Their goal was to hold Alta California um, for the Empire of Spain against their rivals, the French, the English, the Americans. And so they want, to, they want to establish a foothold and they want to control ports along the California coast. That's their geopolitical strategy. Um, and the Spanish colonial project, their overall approach to this uh, was to convert native people, um, uh, acculturate them, and uh, 
make them citizens of Spain with all of the civil and legal rights of citizens of Spain. And so they did this through uh, the religious and culture, acculturation and conversion of indigenous people. Um, and they didn't plan for large numbers of colonists. So they sent relatively small groups um, of people to California um, to try to accomplish this project. Um, the trade and travel were extremely challenging in this time period for these colonists. Um, and they, it, it, these were extremely isolated outposts um, of the Spanish empire. And it, as we'll talk about in a minute, they faced significant resistance um, uh, to, to their program. This is a project I really love and I hope you'll check out um, the conceptual California maps that are published by CS uh, Monterey Bay, CSU Monterey Bay. Um, and they have a wonderful series of maps about this time period in California. And here you see their map of the, you know, the missions, presidios and pueblos in California. And sometimes when you look at this, you go, wow, that's a lot of, that's a lot of, that's a lot of installations. That's a big effort. But in fact, these are extremely isolated communities, um, very small numbers of people. Um, but here, here you see them, the, the, the Spanish settlements in Alta California. Um, in our local area in the watershed, we have the Portola Expedition marching right through in, 18, in 1767. Um, and they write a lot of notes about this as a strategic crossing uh, right between the Santa Cruz and Monterey Bay area and the San Francisco Bay. Um, mission recruitment begins in 1776 with the founding of Mission Dolores in San Francisco and Mission Santa Clara. Um, and they're sending uh, soldiers out to gather up Indians to bring them to those missions. Um, Villages in the mountain areas, however, per persisted throughout the Spanish colonial period. Um, they were not emptied. Um, not everyone went to the missions. These, these areas were hard to get to. Um, and they also had uh, reasons why they wanted to leave some Indians in place there um, to supply them with resources. Um, this is the first time that anyone writes down any of these community names. And so I've included some of them here from the, the Mission Dolores baptismal records. Um, at the headwaters and the uplands of, of the San Francisco watershed um, was a community that's often called the, the Sacones um, with villages like Shishipuka, Chichicat. I'm not going to try to pronounce them all, but at least four or five villages um, in the upland areas of the watershed. Um, Puichon, which is uh, the area of the middle elevation and bay shore of San Francisco, uh, with another three or four villages there. Um, and then Lam Chen, uh, slightly up the peninsula um, into Redwood City, for example, that area in San Carlos, um, another three or four villages. All of these villages would have been located along streams um, and some of them uh, actually at the Bay Shore. But you can see a very densely occupied um, region um, of the peninsula. Here we see the, 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 one of the first mentions of this particular area the Saclan and Puichon area of, of the San Francisco watershed, when in 1797, uh, the mission had to, call the, had to call on the Presidio to send soldiers down to capture runaway uh, Native Americans who, who had left the mission. Um, this, this never stops, the running away from the mission, the recapturing, um, the back and forth. Um, this is a very small number of Spanish people trying to control a, a much larger po population of indigenous people who while interested and attracted by the potential of trade and, um, and contact with, the, with, these new, with these new Spanish arrivals um, are, not, uh, are, are not interested in being held captive as forced labor inside the missions. This resistance continues for over 50 years, it, the entire time period. Here we actually have after the secularization of the missions in 1842, um, a, a scheme uh, to burn down Mission San Jose. Um, the, the, the missions were repeatedly attacked. They, they, were never, they were never really secure. There are hundreds of records um, of violence and resistance um, against, this, against Spanish colonialism. Um, but there was also accommodation and change. Um, and it, what we see on the left is a, is a representation of an event at Mission Dolores. Um, where the, the indigenous people living at the mission um, performed one of their traditional dances in the courtyard in front of the mission. Um, the, even though their stated goal and their philosophy was to wipe out um, indigenous culture and replace it with Spanish culture, 
um, they were really they were really unable to do that, unsuccessful at doing that. And so there's a lot of evidence, um, some really interesting work coming out of uh, Santa Clara University on their mission uh, archaeology that's really showing that um, uh, local indigenous people brought a lot of their um, traditional um, materials and lifeways into the missions and were allowed to continue that. Um, and that they also then um, uh, adopted things that they liked um, of Spanish culture and technology. And so on the right, you see a beautiful Aloni basket um, covered with mission trade beads. Um, so it's a it's a two-way exchange, even though it seems at, at times that there's a, a power differential. Um, that may in fact be an oversimplification of this relationship. Um, and of course, there are many indigenous people who in fact are converted um, and who are sincerely converted to Catholicism um, and, and, and many who continue to practice it today. If you're interested in the issue of religious conversion, um, I've just put a book down here that I found extremely helpful um, when I was working on the, on the Sarah renaming here at Stanford, Converting California by James Sandoz, which is really the most interesting book that looks into the spiritual life um, of native people in the missions. And so I highly recommend that book if you're interested in that topic. And in this really complex and nuanced relationship um, between religious faith um, and indigenous people in the missions. So the ultimately, however, the Franciscan missions fail. Um, uh, they fail in their program. Um, they fail to acculturate and they fail to um, send out independent communities onto the land to function as citizens of Spain. Um, they have a very hard time letting go um, of the native people that they have at the missions. And they run into a very high demand for Indian labor uh, on the part of the Pueblos and Presidios um, and this sort of competition, strategic competition and politically they lose that fight. Um, and there's an order to secularize the missions. Uh, and it, that um, in the 18th, early 1830s um, by the Republic of Mexico. A lot of, I'm, I'm glossing over a huge amount of, of politics of Mexican and Spanish colonialism here, but the result of this is that they're, the lands of the missions are being granted to settlers and uh, mainly to military veterans, both Mexican and indigenous people who had served in the Mexican armies. Um, and so you start to see the practice of land granting in the 1830s. Um, trade and transportation remain very difficult um, during this time period. And these are still fairly isolated communities and small communities um, of, of Mexican settlements. I think San Francisco in 1842 had 200 people in it. So these are not, these are not large cities yet. Um, the indigenous people who had been associated with the missions, I mean, there were 2000 um, indigenous people at Mission San Jose when the, when the mission was, was allegedly going to be closed. Um, groups of these mission uh, uh, converts applied um, to receive some of the mission land. And there was a governor um, of Mexico who thought that was a good idea. And then two late years later, he died and his successor um, largely granted that uh, land to other people. There are a number of, uh, of uh, Ohlone people who did get some small land grants. And we can talk more about that maybe later. Um, but largely you now have large pop still large populations um, of indigenous people still outnumbering Mexican or Spanish people in the Bay Area um, who, whose uh, security is precarious again um, as, the, as the Mexican government is giving land away to other people that you might be living on. Um, uh, it, it could be your ancestral village, it could be the Mission Rancho, but um, you, you have no paper title and land is being traded and swapped and bought and sold um, and you're, you're living on it. Um, and you're essentially living on it as uh, with, the, with the Mexican owner as your patron and you're performing labor um, in return for, for living there. Um, and we, we can talk more about those labor practices uh, when we're doing some work on that if you're interested in it. Um, there's a slight increase in Mexican colonists during this time period and a trickle um, of non-Mexican settlers. 
uh, many of whom, not all of them, but many of whom are sh what are called ship jumpers. So during this time period, there's a, there's, there's a huge amount of trade going on in the Pacific, including, of course, whaling and trade, uh, the so-called Manila galleons, trade with, uh, trade with the Philippines in the East. And, you know, and, and also these military vessels of these rival powers that are patrolling the coast. And it was hard work working on one of those ships. Uh, and many of the military uh, naval vessels were staffed by impressed sailors, people who were just picked up off the street and forced in, into service. And when they could escape those ships, they did. And so there, there are not, we're, we'll talk about ship jumpers in a minute. There are a lot of uh, mostly men who leave those ships um, from all over the world um, who start to trickle into uh, the Pueblo of San Jose and, and of San Francisco. Um, let's talk about, uh, about the really local upper watershed here. There's an increasing demand for lumber. The missions and presidios were built with lumber from the Searsville area, um, but it would take a team of bulls, um, they didn't always have oxen, uh, two days to drag one, one beam, one logged redwood to San Francisco. Um, it was very slow, it was very hard. Um, so there is a demand and a trade in lumber, and we'll talk more about that. Um, there's also what's called the hide and tallow trade. Um, hide meaning leather um, that was being sent to Europe, um, high demand for leather in Europe, and tallow for candles. Just like the whaling industry was partly about whale oil for lamps, um, the tallow industry was also about lighting um, in this early, early time period. So thousands of cows, of cattle, roaming everywhere and uh, destroying a lot of that natural diversity we talked about in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, they're starting to build roads, more roads um, in the Mexican period, and roads that joined the coast to the bay. And so roads through mountain passes, uh, roads through places like Searsville um, uh, became important, but the waterways are still the most important way to move anything heavy, to move freight, to move trade. Um, the Searsville area emerges as a crossroads between Santa Cruz and Monterey Bay area, um, San Jose and San Francisco. Uh, as, as the Portola expedition found, it was one route through the Santa Cruz mountains and it becomes extremely important. And it is then driving this lumber trade. Um, the other thing that we've discovered is a very complex network of Mexican family uh, connections during this time period. And what, uh, what I have to say is really an impressive amount of women uh, exercising power and influence um, and trading um, and running businesses during this time period. It, stories that, that I don't think have been really told before. Um, but this entire economic system is still relying almost overwhelmingly, almost totally on indigenous labor. So the notion that some people have that somehow you know, um, the ancestral Ohlone people wound up in the missions Oops, oops, the diseases got them and they were all gone and they were all dead. Um, it, it, we're just, we, we really are finding that that's not true and that there are hundreds of indigenous people living in the, in the local area and on the peninsula. Um, and, and they are the engine um, of this economy in the, in the Mexican period as well. Uh, this, is about, this is about trade and waterways. Um, this is just a map I happen to like, so I put it in here. And what you're going to see that I circled in yellow are these landings, right? So that you see the Embarcadero, that's Embarcadero Road in Palo Alto, by the way. Um, you're, you're bringing uh, logs and hides and tallow, et cetera, um, down these roads like, like uh, Embarcadero Road um, uh, and, and some of these other, uh, San Antonio Road. There are a number of very old roads in the South Bay. And your goal is to get that stuff out to these landings, right? So you'll see the road to like Clark's Landing and Ringstorff's Landing and Bernardo's Landing. And so your goal is to get it to someplace where you can float it, right? So you're either floating it in, in seas, or you're floating it up the Guadalupe and Coyote Rivers to San Jose, or you're floating it up the Bay to San Francisco. So it's it, when, when you're at Cooley Landing or you're in a number of these other places in the Bay Area and you see a landing, um, this is this is really what that was about. It was absolutely critical um, to uh, to the local economy. Uh, this is a map um, that one of my uh, colleagues, Tim Wilcox, made for me of the Rancho boundaries, um, laid over today's map so that we could all you know register ourselves in it. 
Um, and what's, what's really important to understand is that the San Francisco watershed is incredibly complex in this time period. And so you'll see there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight ranchos um, in the watershed, at least maybe nine. And so it's a very attractive and strategic location for the ranchos because San Francisco Creek carries a lot of water and there's another set of streams that are coming down um, you know, in the Los Altos Mountain View area. And then as you go a little further north, Boyeras Creek, San Mateo Creek, um, the, the Mexican ranchos need water too. And so it's a strategic area for, for Mexican settlement as it was um, uh, also for the ancestral Ohlone. Um, we can talk more about that. Uh, one of the most important land grants, Rancho de las Pulgas, which really runs from San Francisco all the way up through San Carlos, an enormous land grant, 35,000 acres. It was the first major grant in San Mateo County, um, provisionally given in 1795 and confirmed in 1835 to Jose Dario Arguello, whose son was one of the governors of Alta California, um, confirmed that land to his family. Um, that rancho contained at least three Ohlone villages. Um, and, it, and it was controlled um, after 1830 um, by Maria Soledad de Arguello, um, who built a house in San Carlos. And Doña Arguello controlled that land um, up until the 1880s. Um, and although she had to sell most of it to pay her lawyers, um, she was really a, a local force in Mexican and early American society. Um, the Rancho de las Pulgas, partly because it was so large and that original land grant in 30, of 35,000 acres was drawn in a, in a very sketchy map. Um, uh, there were, there were, it was a subject of considerable land claim litigation um, uh, about its boundaries. And this in fact is how Dennis Martin lost the North Ranch um, to the Arguellos. And we can talk more about that later. Um, the Arguellos were mainly about livestock grazing for hide and tallow. The Arguello family rarely actually lived on the rancho. They were mainly up in San Francisco um, and they had other grant. They also had land in Santa Barbara. Um, and so they had a series of tenant um, rancheros who, who ran their livestock um, on this very large rancho, a portion of which they sold to Leland Stanford later. Um, and the next important one, um, Cañada de Raimundo. Um, uh, uh, it's not 35,000 acres, excuse that. It's, hold on. Anyway, this is Juan Coppinger's rancho. And I'm sorry, my slide isn't fully corrected. Um, Juan Coppinger was a, a, a ship jumper, um, a British ship jumper who married a uh, uh, Maria Soto, married a local rancho's daughter. Um, and then also became a citizen of Mexico and served in the Mexican army and petitioned for a land grant. Um, he got into an argument with the Arguellos about the boundaries of that um, and died before that was resolved. And his widow married John Greer, um, who people who are interested in the history of Palo Alto know a lot about John Greer. Uh, the town and country shopping center is located where John Greer's farm was. Um, but his wife, uh, Maria Soto Greer, um, controlled this very large rancho um, uh, Cañada de Raimundo, that was, and it was inherited by her daughter. Um, El Corte de Madera, Cañada El Corte de Madera, both granted to Maximo Martinez. Maximo Martinez was born at Mission Dolores in San Francisco um, and uh, lived most of his life at the Pueblo of San Jose. Um, his family then, when he was granted this land in 1833, moved to what's now Portola Valley, very active in the hide and tallow trade, excuse my typo, and did some lumbering. Uh, he was a justice of the peace at the Pueblo of San Jose. And so the Pueblo of San Jose papers at History San Jose have a lot of material about Maximo Martinez. Um, and we're working with some of our colleagues to translate that from the Spanish so we can learn more about um, the really uh, complex layered set of land transactions that he did with his friends and neighbors, including Dennis Martin, the South Ranch, what is now Web Ranch uh, in Portola Valley. Um, San Francisco, uh, which is located down here, closer to the Stanford campus, um, also very important in the story of the watershed. Antonio Buelna occupied it in 1837 uh, and, and then was granted it later. Um, uh, he, he dies and his widow, Maria Valencia Buelna, um, controlled that property. She married uh, a widower with seven children, Francisco Rodriguez, 
uh, and they lived in what was called the Buena Rodriguez Adobe uh, near the Stanford Golf Course. Um, but before he died, Antonio Buelna built a toll road, which is now Sand Hill Road, with the goal of uh, getting these lumber wagons from uh, the Searsville area to use his road to get down to the Embarcadero. And he charged a toll um, to drive through his Creek Ford uh, on his private road. Um, it is rumored that, um, that he got in a dispute with one of his neighbors about that uh, and that there was a shooting, but um, I cannot recapture all of those newspaper articles right now. This building of private roads, of toll roads, though, um, is extremely important in this time period. Um, somebody's got to build the road, right? And they want to try to get some money for it, um, the labor, um, the almost certainly indigenous labor that was building these roads. Um, Rodriguez, uh, Francisco Rodriguez, uh, signed the rancho away at a poker game and then later claimed that he uh, thought he was only leasing it and that they had gotten him drunk before he signed the paper. And, but his wife lost a claim, uh, lost the court case over that. Um, and uh, San Francisco was purchased by George Gordon and later became uh, the Mayfield Grange and then later the Palo Alto estate of Leland, Stan Leland and Jane Stanford. Antonio Buelna, not to be confused with Felix Buelna. I sometimes find myself confused about it. The builder of Casa Tableta uh, in 1852, uh, which is now the Alpine Inn in Portola Valley. Uh, and he also, we believe, built the portion of Alpine Road that goes from a Rastadero Road in the Alpine Inn up to the skyline as a toll road. And also to reach some property in Pescadero that some of his relatives owned. Um, this is Felix Buelna with three of his daughters. Um, and I sometimes get them confused. Uh, another, another important Mexican land grant that a lot of us uh, have, have heard about before, um, El Parisima de Concepcion, which is largely Los Altos, Los Altos Hills, um, immediately uh, 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 adjacent to the Stanford campus, um, bordered by a Rastradero Road, which is a very old road. It was one of these roads to a landing, right? It was one of these uh, logging roads to a landing. Um, it was originally granted to uh, uh, two Ohlone men from Mission Santa Clara in 1840. And apparently, Juana Briones uh, convinced them that to sell it to her because once the Americans got here, the Americans wouldn't let Indians own land. Um, and so she bought it from them and allowed them to live on it for the rest of their lives, which they did. Um, and, it, and, and she may have been right that it would have been difficult for them to hold on to that claim. Um, or she may have been ripping them off, it's hard to know, but they did live with her on that land uh, until they passed away. And there were a number of other Ohlone's um, living on the rancho uh, uh, during one of Briones's lifetime. She's a whole nother long story. Um, and she's connected to all these other people at the other ranchos that we're talking about. Um, this is just to set, setting us up really for, for, for the transition from uh, Mexican colonialism to American colonialism, which it, this is a very short period, right? That the Mexicans have, kept, have control of Alta California, it's only 22 years. Well, they managed to grant, you'll see these um, David Hornbuck, David Fuller maps here. They managed to grant the entire peninsula um, in Mexican land grants um, uh, before, before uh, losing California to, um, to the United States. Um, and then you'll see down below though, um, in 1860, most of those land claims are still contested um, because American colonists who are flooding in during the gold rush um, are expecting that the American government will, um, will give them land if they homestead it and that the American government will ignore um, Mexican land title um, and simply give them the land. Um, this was largely the case in Western colonial expansion in the US and so the, the, the number of squatters was truly um, uh, astonishing, including Rancho San Francisco that we talked about for a minute had four squatters living on it. Um, and uh, after the Arguellos run, won their big land claim in the US courts, um, uh, George Gordon paid off the squatters and made them leave because it became clear that he, his purchase from the well-known Rodriguez family um, gave him legal title. So th this is a period of huge uproar um, in land uh, ownership and land claims, and there's a lot of violence and a lot of court cases about it, um, including in our part of the watershed. Um, so, the, so 
I, I think it's important, you know, really to look at uh, when you read traditional, um, you know, second secondary sources, histories of Woodside, um, histories of the San Francisco Peninsula. These are the kind of people that you're hearing about. You're hearing about Juan Coppinger um, uh, and John Greer uh, and Dennis Martin and Martin Murphy uh, and Charles Brown. Um, these are tough men um, uh, who come into California and create fortunes for themselves. And they loom large in these historical narratives. And it's really not the full story um, of what's going on up there. And it, and it really um, uh, obscures you know, some of those stories. It, it's not that these men weren't tough and weren't strong and didn't have a, an influence over history here. Um, it's just that it's not the whole story. Um, uncovering those more diverse narratives as we've, during the pandemic, um, some of my staff have really gone deep on primary sources, both at the Pueblo of San Jose of uh, uh, the 1852 state census, the San Mateo County Historical Association, Portola Valley Archives, the Bancroft. We've really been looking at a lot of primary material, a mountain of it. Um, we have over 300 maps of the Searsville area, historic maps, um, thousands of census records. It's, it's large. Um, and, but we're starting to see that there is more diver diversity in these primary sources. Um, Charles Brown, who we talked about in a minute, ship jumper from Baltimore, um, who brought his enslaved Africans with him um, to California uh, and worked in his logging camps uh, in the Searsville area. Um, he also had indigenous labor who worked for him. Uh, Charles Brown was a notoriously violent and litigious man. And so the Pueblo San, San Jose records um, are full of stuff about him and also about him as Carlos Moreno, you know, um, Ch Charles Brown uh, in Spanish. And so we're really just starting to work through that. And I have to say, I was really um, uh, surprised um, to see the number of enslaved Africans who were in California and in Mayfield um, during this time period. Um, California was supposed to be an anti-slavery state. Uh, slavery was illegal in Mexico. Um, but there's an astonishing number of, of African Americans listed as slaves in the 1852 and 1860 census um, in, the, in the local area. And I think their story needs to be told. Um, uh, Dennis Martin, uh, the famous uh, Dennis Martin came over on that wagon train through the Sierra um, and established a series of sawmills um, with Chinese and Ohlone laborers. Uh, he had an adopted um, son that he adopted, uh, Native American son that he adopted up in Placerville. He has a very interesting biography and story that we're looking into as well. Um, th there's a large number of entrepreneurial women um, here in the upper watershed, and including one, I'm sorry, I've forgotten her name at the moment, who dressed as a man and uh, was a teamster and hauled lumber. And it was only discovered she was a woman when she gave birth <laughs> at, one of the, uh, at one of the local um, stagecoach inns. So there's some really great stories um, about, about these uh, uh, about these pioneers um, and about their allies and uh, uh, the people who were, who were doing the work and making this possible. Um, and there were, and we really wanna find more of those narratives and tell more of those stories. Um, there's also a really, another thing I was surprised by in kind of a sad way um, uh, during this time period in both the Mexican colonial period and the American colonial period, the use of indigenous and immigrant orphans as unpaid labor. And so uh, we see in the census in, in 1852 and 1860, for example, San Francisco, 200 people, um, uh, 15 of those 200 people were uh, uh, or Indian Native American orphans um, living as servants in people's houses. We're talking about children as young as nine years old listed as servants. Um, so this was, I, I was firstly horrified by this. There was a, a so-called slave trade in Indian children during the American period as well in California. And then as I dug deeper into what it meant to be an orphan, um, I, I really did discover that um, uh, how precarious it was out here, you know, on the edge of the frontier um, during this time period. And orphans from Ireland and the Azores and um, Germany and Switzerland and Missouri and New York were winding up um, being uh, essentially indentured labor in people's houses. And this is just something I think um, th this aspect of child labor 
that I'm not sure that we fully understood in California history when we knew about it in factories on the East Coast, but I'm not sure we understood how widespread it was here. And I'd really love to, 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 to learn more about that and, and, and to see whether there are any, any stories of survivors of that system. Um, here's another surprise we found as we were looking through this archival record. Um, there was a widespread view that the, because the native people of the peninsula were sandwiched in between Mission Dolores and Mission, and Mission uh, Santa Cruz and, and Mission Santa Clara, that they were all swept up into the missions very early and that they, um, they all died and the, and the land was empty. Um, but in fact, when Mission Dolores closed, um, uh, hundreds of Native Americans from Mission Dolores moved on to what was called the Mission Rancho near Milbrae, near Coyote Point, San Mateo, large lands that the mission had controlled and petitioned the governor for that land. Um, the land was granted to the Sanchez family instead at Rancho Burry Burry, um, but we see 56 people living there in the 1852 census and almost 100 in 1860. So there was a, there was a community, a large village, um, Rancheria here on the peninsula um, as late as 1860 that, that's really absent from most of the secondary sources right now. Uh, in fact, this area, um, uh, there, there were, there were uh, Native Americans living at Coyote Point up until the 1910s and 1920s. Um, and, and insisting that it had been granted to them by the missions. Um, this kind of persistent occupation and reoccupation during the Mexican and early American colonial periods um, is also the subject of a project that um, is happening on midpin lands in the upper watershed, being led by Mike Wilcox from Stanford, Sam Campbell from Foothill College. Um, and these are some of the artifacts that give me a slide that they've been finding up there. Um, uh, classic uh, spanning both ancestral and the colonial period um, occupation site in the upper watershed, um, occupied for several hundred years, year round by indigenous people using both traditional tools and materials and uh, European tools and materials. Very important site and I'm really looking forward to what else we're going to learn from them. Um, What's going on economically in the Mexican and early American uh, colonial period is lumber. Um, I'm sure you're not surprised by that. Um, lumber in the missions, uh, there are records of indigenous people um, at a village they call the Rumstuck, um, which I'm not sure exactly where that was, but, they, but, but it's, in the, it's in this part of, it, it's probably San Francisco watershed or up near Crystal Springs, um, cutting lumber in 1787 um, for the mission. Um, also meant more records of uh, mission uh, converts fleeing the mission um, and going into the mountains. Um, and the mission allowing some of them to stay there as long as they would provide, cut wood for the missions and the, and the Pueblos and Presidios. And so we think these villages really are um, never really abandoned. Um, and then there are the ship jumpers. Um, one of these sources, I have it down here, I think it's probably the um, it may be the Burgess lumbering in Hispanic California, it talks about these ship jumpers and estimates that there were 50 or 60, 50 to 60 ship jumpers in the Santa Cruz mountains in the 1830s. And they were just cutting down trees, um, squatting on land and trying to find somebody to sell, trying to find a probably indigenous labor to help them drag it down to the water and sell it. Um, lumber was traded locally and by ship uh, to Santa Barbara, Los Angeles. These are less forested places. Um, Chile and Peru and to the Pacific Islands. Redwood was highly valued um, because it was less susceptible to rot. Um, lumber was dragged by bulls to San Francisco or San Jose or floated on those uh, on, on the bay uh, up to get on these ships to go uh, uh, trade along the coast. Um, there's a transition to mills in the late 1840s and to a, a, a more aggressive and faster harvesting of the lumber in the watershed. Um, we, and we may talk about that again a little bit more, um, and an in, a, a huge influx of migrant labor during the gold rush. So we went from, oh, I don't know, 50 or 60 people in the Santa Cruz Mountains to 1,000 people in Redwoods, which was the, the community that forms between what's now the town of Woodside and Searsville um, in the Mountain Home Road area. 1,000 people uh, in 1852 up there trying to cut wood. Um, in this early period, the ship jumper period, you would have had a couple of guys with, a, with one of these crosscut saws who would cut down one of these big trees 
and then try to drag it out to some water to get to, to, to sell it. Um, uh, Charles, uh, William Smith, Bill the Sawyer, one of those ship jumpers, built the first saw pit. He, he arrives here, he jumps ship in 1816, 1832. He, he dug a big pit in the ground and you could lay that cut, cut um, uh, trunk across it and actually saw it into planks. Um, this, this happens for the first time in 1832, makes it easier to transport, makes it more easily usable. Um, and then Charles Brown, the notorious Charles Brown from Baltimore, um, built the first mill in San Mateo County in 1849, uh, water powered mill, it washed out in a year, but he, he built another one. Um, Dennis Martin, this is extremely confusing, but Dennis Martin built four mills. Um, it took us quite some time to figure this out, how many mills he built, um, but he built four. Um, and there's also a huge economy in uh, pickets and shingles. Um, and these lumber boom towns that have vanished today of Searsville, West Union, Whiskey Hill, um, and towns with a thousand people in them for a short period of time um, that then disappear. Uh, here is the town of Searsville, um, a map of it um, and, and a photo of what that looks like. Um, by the way, we, we can talk more about this later. I see that I'm running a little bit late and I wanna make sure I cover it all. So if you've got more questions about Searsville, we'll come back to it. Um, American colonial period, this is based on some thesis work by Robert Rood at UC Santa Cruz, tracing the mills. You see those yellow dots, those are those early sawmills. Um, and then the, uh, the different colors as they march um, into La Honda and then south into the Big Basin area. Um, lumbering is over in the Searsville area but by 1860, um, except for a few shingle makers. Um, what happens, what replaces lumbering? Um, here's another surprise I wasn't aware of, dairying. Um, it, it starts off with some, with some women who were bringing in their surplus household butter to trade at, at Tripp's store in Woodside. Um, we went through those with the Woodside store records for that. And then by 1865, we have mass production of hundreds of pounds of butter um, in the upper watershed. Um, we also see the emergence of leisure and entertainment, not just the Casa Tableta roadhouse for your poker, but racetracks and foot races and picnicking and country excursions. Um, and and we, we can see this carrying forward if we were gonna talk about Searsville Lake Park, which we, we might do at a future date, but it's, it's a, considered a beautiful place to go. It's a, it's a beautiful destination. It's cool and it's shady and it's beautiful and um, attractive. And I, and I think it still is that today. All right, I'm gonna talk briefly now about, about archeology. span um, our goal is to preserve sites um, and not to dig them up. And so we're always looking to existing collections before excavating. And we have a lot of existing collections. Um, we wanna minimize impact. Um, so we do low impact excavations. We dig less than we used to because, we're, because of our preservation goals. Um, and also unfortunately, increased digital access to maps um, is generating increased looting by treasure hunters. I almost put in a whole series of slides about how terrible treasure hunters are. Um, we have looting of historic sites here at Stanford um, and we're very concerned about that and, and concerned about protecting these deposits. Um, and we have to do a more aggressive intervention um, where we find uh, active looting. So uh, ancestral Ohlone sites, we have 120 um, dated contacts, dated occupation sites and features in the San Francisco watershed. Um, our current approach is minimally invasive sampling. Um, we dig very shallow excavations. We're trying to avoid to the maximum extent possible encountering anyone's ancestor buried in the ground. Um, instead, we're using these legacy collections um, in close consultation with our tribal advisors who are very interested in, in, in learning more um, about this period. Um, and we're really trying to maximize long-term preservation of these sites. Um, Spanish colonial period, we're remapping the Portola expedition in the hopes that we might have a Portola camp that we could find. Um, we're looking again at these legacy collections that we excavated. Sometimes the question we were asking was about ancestral Ohlone, or the question I was asking was about Dennis Martin, but um, is it possible that there's older material in some of those um, collections that, that, that I just didn't notice, that we just didn't, didn't identify the first pass through? And we've got some really interesting collaborations going on with the Moak Maloney Tribe Santa Clara University, Fido College, and uh, Midpen, and some other places. Um, there's a very big interest in re-looking at Spanish colonial archaeology and mission archaeology here in the Bay Area. Um, and then we, we have at least two um, uh, village sites that span the, special, the, the transition 
um, into Spanish colonialism in the upper watershed. Um, and so we may think about um, how, to, how to investigate those sites further. Mexican colonial era, we have um, artifacts from the Buena Rodriguez Adobe site, and we're taking another look at those collections right now. Um, uh, there are a number of sites in the Los Trancos Alpine Road Corridor associated with Maximo Martinez and his friends and relatives um, that we're doing some survey work on, uh, working closely with Portola Valley Archives and History San Jose. Um, we did some recent work at Dennis Martin North Ranch, again, revisiting um, uh, the St. Dennis C Cemetery site, the St. Dennis Church site, um, to see what we can find out from this period. And there's a great deal of potential, actually, for more archaeology of the Mexican era. Oh, here's, you think this is the Nazca lines. This is our sampling last summer at the Dennis Martin North Ranch site. Um, transects and test pits we did um, looking for the farmhouse that was under construction when Dennis Martin lost the North Ranch. Um, and we think we may have found it. Um, more about that later. Early American colonial period. Um, we did find one of the squatter homesteads um, in the Arboretum, the Bevins site, um, that we have some interesting research about. Um, and then at the end of this period, we see the emergence of gentlemen farmers in the 1860s, Job Felt, um, uh, Henry P. Kuhn, George Gordon, um, Martin Mur uh, Daniel Murphy, one of Martin Murphy's brothers in the local area. And we have found some deposits associated with those families as well, and their Chinese labor, and, and potentially some indigenous labor on those sites as well. Um, we do have some investigations that have been happening at the town of Searsville, extremely challenging site um, to work at because of the sediment um, deposition there, um, because of historic dredging to maintain the lake, um, and because of a really rather astonishingly thick forest of poison oak down there. But we do have the potential in the project um, as we're starting to restore some of those stream channels to see some really interesting uh, archaeological deposits at Searsville. Um, looking forward here, um, we have very large data sets now, very large search areas, and collaboration is our major strategy um, with the Maloney community, other stakeholder communities, Stanford partners, these regional partners. I have a meeting, you know, here at my lab this week uh, with some people from San Jose State and uh, Santa Clara University and Foothill College, UC Santa Cruz, to see how we can get some traction on these bigger questions. Um, and also uh, to learn more and to meet new people and to hear new voices um, through that environmental review process. Um, the long view, uh, as Mike Wilcox calls it, deep time, um, ancestral Malek Maloney, been here for 9,000 years. Um, we've been doing archaeology here and, and historical research on California history since Mary Sheldon Barnes Pacific Slope History Project um, in the 1890s. Um, someone will be explaining how flawed and incomplete the approach my team and I were taking um, in the 2090s. And we really want to hope we've saved enough heritage sites for them to study in 70 years, and maybe in 7,000 years, um, although I expect those sites um, may be underwater. Um, you can see some of the people I wanted to thank here, uh, but I really want to um, make sure we've got time for questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and. Hopefully we can have a conversation about some of this. Fantastic. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I think some of the work that you do is just covers such an incredible breadth um, that it's, <laughs> it's really um, kind of mind boggling actually uh, what you and your team are looking at. Um, uh, so for those of you that have questions, please, uh, you can enter them now into the Q&A portion, um, or sorry, uh, by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'd be happy to take them. Uh, just to kick off from the top, Laura, how is this information? I mean, you, you say you've just got a wealth of primary resources and, and, and data that you're pulling up. How is that being, is there a way that the public can view some of that now, or you know, do you have ongoing ways of sharing that, or or eventually, kind of how will this be shared with folks? You know, this week we're writing all of that I just told you about into fifteen pages in an environmental technical report. <laughs> if you want to try to imagine how, so one of my postdocs, Katrinka Reinhardt, is writing fifteen pages out of that. Um, but we are really interested. We do produce a lot of. Um, uh, summary reports about our research. And so we're looking into, you know, obviously we'd, we'd love to partner with the Historical Society and Sandstone Tile to bring some of it out. Um, we're also looking at self-publishing some of it. 
Um, uh, we do a lot of, I do a lot of talks and lectures. The Community and History uh, Conference we're doing next week, um, some of my staff are presenting at. Um, uh, we're hoping to partner uh, with people like the New Palo Alto Museum um, to get some of this stuff really out there, you know, into the broader um, uh, museum context so people can see it. Um, and, I, and I'm interested in suggestions that people have because we, we, we just have massive amounts of information. We, we do try, by the way, when we digitize material and translate it, we send it back to the archives we got it from um, so that they can serve it digitally. So we have a good working partnership with San Mateo County Historical Association. Uh, and now we're, we're gonna be working with History San Jose on this as well. So trying to, trying to give, you know, add to that conversation and give, uh, make that more accessible to people. Great, thank you. Okay, um, so we have a question from an audience member. How large was the average village size at each location? Sort of on the peninsula, on the bay, and in the hills? So, you know, in the upland watershed, right? So up in the Jasper Ridge Sewageville area, our research, uh, research done by, a, by a, one of my former um, colleagues, uh, Barbara Bochak, the first campus archeologist, um, was showing a population at one of the villages inside Jasper Ridge, year round population of between 70 and 80 people, right? Um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty good sized village, 70 to 80 people. Now down at the Bay Shore, at the estuary in East Palo Alto, um, uh, there also would have been a, a probably a larger village, three or 400 people in that village. Um, when you're looking at some of the really strategic um, uh, uh, crossroads of, say, uh, the sites in, in, on the Guadalupe River in downtown San Jose or the sites up in Emeryville, you know, on the, on the Sacramento River Delta, you could have villages um, of over a thousand people. Um, but, you know, in our little hinterland, it was probably more like a hundred in, in, the, in the villages um, uh, sort of sprinkled um, around these creeks. Great, thank you. Uh, another viewer asks, uh, from your talk, it seems the Ohlone weren't as vulnerable to diseases upon contact with the Spanish in the late 18th century as Mesoamericans were upon the 1519 conquest. Did the Ohlone develop immunity or was it their remoteness from large population centers or something else? You know, you know, there, there are people who write about, about disease um, epidemics and, and population de demographics in North America. And you know, that, that huge epidemic um, that, that followed um, DeSoto's expedition to the Mississippi. There is some evidence of huge die-offs coming into the West and even into California um, before, before formal colonization began. And certainly um, many uh, Native Californians died um, from epidemic disease. So, so did many Mexican and Spanish colonists, right? Um, nobody had immunity to measles or cholera or typhoid. Um, so, but the, the, the work that Sherburne Kirk did up at Berkeley, it's showing um, those high mortality rates, um, I, I think is obscuring the fact that not everyone dies, right? And so you get, yes, a lot of people died. Um, there's absolutely no doubt about it. Um, uh, colonial occupation is, is, creates a, an, an enormous set of stress on a population. Food systems are disrupted. Um, living conditions are poor, um, and, and people did die of diseases. But what, but we, what we discover in the primary record is that many people survived, right? And they're out on the landscape. They're not gone. And the, the so-called the erasure, the notion that the land is empty is part of that is a story that just justifies taking it, right? And so we need to make, we need to ask ourselves the question, are they here or not? Is there evidence for, for, for ancestral Ohlone people still being here? And there is, right? Um, not huge numbers, smaller numbers, certainly, than before the mission period, but, but, but they were still here. Thank you. Uh, some questions about the Farallons. Uh, when did the Bay flood exactly and the Farallons become <laughs> surrounded with water? And is it true that you could walk to them at one point? It's true that you could walk to them at one point. Um, you're going to have to Google the date. I think it's somewhere between, somewhere around 8,000 years ago, it starts to breach the Golden Gate and the bay starts to fill gradually. Um, but that's, somebody else is, a, is an expert in that. Um, but yes, there are, there are beautiful maps you can find online um, of showing that people could walk out to the Farallons. 
And just the, just the I have to tell you, it's just super exciting as an archeologist to imagine how many um, archeological sites are underwater. The Trans Bay um, tube, tum the new BART tunnel they dug hit Ohlone archeological sites under the bay. Um, and so we know they're out there, but they're hard to find. Okay, um, question about sort of on the botanical side, is there any evidence that poison oak was less or more prevalent historically than it is today? I wanna show you my poison oak. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, I, I have poison oak right now. So oh, I, I have to say oh, I'm no. highly motivated about this. So about mm, something like a third of, of, gen of the general public is not um, allergic. Um, and the estimate is that for indigenous people, um, there's, there's, there's a uh, less people get the rash, but I have to tell you the, 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 the ancestral alone had four or five remedies for poison oak rash, <laughs> right? So people still got poison oak. Was, was there less poison oak? There probably was because their land management practice, which included a lot of burning, um, of brush and scrub, um, and a lot of, uh, uh, management of trees. Um, there was probably less brush, right, um, around there, around the landscape. Um, and so I, my, I'm guessing there was less poison oak, but we know, we know they had it. I will confess I am one of those people in that 30% that is not allergic to poison oak. <laughs> um, so I count myself very lucky. Um, I'm sorry, Laura. <clears throat> um, so someone asks, uh, has anyone asked biologists why the steelhead runs on the San Francisco Creek were not bigger? Um, you know, the biologists don't have an answer for that. Um, archaeologists have been taking a look at it. And one theory, there's a theory, is that the, the ancestral Ohlone, uh, and, and we know they did this, they built fishing weirs. They built these essentially net, these, these barriers, these nets at the mouth of the estuary in East Palo Alto. And so they were probably taking a lot of fish before they got upstream. Um, Although even the sites that we find in East Palo Alto don't have a huge amount of salmon bone in them. So we have some salmon remains in our, in our rather large collection of kitchen midden, but not as many as you would expect. And part of that is really just that San Francisco, even though it's one of the largest creeks on the peninsula, is in the context of the Pacific Northwest, not a very big river. And so, um, you know, certainly we support biodiversity and the survivance of the steelhead's important, but it, it, this was never a major, a major steelhead run. There just wasn't enough water. Okay, um, on to some more archaeology questions. What about Stanford's role in the analysis of a large, and by Stanford, I assume maybe your team, in the analysis of a large shell mound in Mountain View or Palo Alto in the late 1800s, um, which was destroyed in the 1930s yeah. and 40s. So Mary Sheldon Barnes, um, who, who, who was a lecturer in history here, um, a, a very innovative teacher, um, really well-known, famous in the history of social studies um, for taking her students out in the field to do field work. And so she sent her students to Chinatown in San Francisco to, to interview immigrants. She sent them to Native American rancherias. She sent them out to do archeology. span So she's very famous for this. And she excavated at the Castro Mound, which was a huge archeological site down there in Mountain View. Um, the site was then later also excavated by the Stanford Medical School um, because the human remains that were in it had astonishingly good preservation, um, very well-preserved uh, bone. Um, we repatriated that collection uh, to the Ohlone community back in 1989. Um, and as a student, I managed the, the, the handling of, of, of those collections. And I have to say that beautiful, beautifully preserved collections um, from the Castro Mount, um, excavated uh, actually in the 1890s and the 1930s and the 1950s uh, by Stanford without anyone ever writing a report. So when you say, well, where can I read that report? There was never a report. Yeah. Um, but there was a very large collection and we still have some artifacts from the Castro Mount in the Stanford University archeology span collections. Uh, did the Ohlone build any kind of roads? You know, it's a good question about the roads. Yeah. So the Stanford University archives 
has this very interesting map that Mary Shelton Barnes interviewed two uh, Moac Maloney men in San Mateo, Pedro Avencio and his son, Joe Avencio, who were living in San Mateo on the old Mission Rancho in the, in the 1890s. And Joe Avencio drew a map from Mary Sheldon Barnes in colored pencil. She probably brought it with her to talk to him of Indian trails on the peninsula. And, um, and, it, and it's, it's oddly scaled, but it's got the logging road to Searsville on it. Um, and it's in, this, it's in the Stanford uh, University archives in the, in, in the Mary Sheldon Barnes Pacific Slope collection. So we know they had roads and trails. Um, uh, that linked important uh, village sites to each other. And, you know, people were, were trading and intermarrying, and there are lots of records um, th that talk about, okay, let's imagine that I'm, I'm living, um, uh, you know, in the Puichon territory, and my aunt passes away in Half Moon Bay. Um, I'm walking from Palo Alto to Half Moon Bay, to that funeral and I'm gonna stay a couple of weeks and I'm gonna gather some shellfish, I'm gonna do a bunch of stuff. Um, and so there were well-known um, and, and understood Indian trails. Highway 92 was an Indian trail, right? So these passes through the mountains that, 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 that have been used and reused um, and that we still drive on today that started off as Indian trails. Can you, uh, you may have touched on this a bit in your presentation, but just kind of remind us again, what the differences are between a Mexican land grant versus a Spanish land grant? It's really just a time period, right? Okay. So um, Mexico becomes independent from Spain, I think in, in 1822. And the Spanish government gave very few land grants. Um, uh, the missions were very firmly in control of land. Um, they were having a hard time even holding the presidios. They were under attack constantly from Native Americans. Um, and they, they were having a really hard time settling California. And so there are very few, there are very few Spanish land grants. Almost all the land grants you hear about those ranchos um, were established after 1822 uh, by the Mexican government. Are there any specific plans to do archaeology on the sediment in the lake once a hole is drilled in the dam? We're, we, you know, we're doing all kinds of sophisticated analysis about the, <laughs> the sediment in the lake. Um, the, we're super interested in what's underneath that sediment. And the engineers tell me that they think they can do all this work without going below the sediment into the native ground surface. And I'm skeptical about that. Um, this, is, this is big civil engineering, but it's also you know, we could have a huge winter storm and everything could just, nature could ignore the civil engineer's model. And so, we, yeah, our problem at the moment, we, we, did, we did do some test pits um, and uh, they filled with water and they had, and they were also so loose that they were unsafe to, ex to put a person in. And so um, we're likely to, to have kind of an accelerated investigation um, once they put the hole in the dam and they start, well, they're actually going to probably dewater the reservoir. Before, they, have to, they have to take the water out of the reservoir to drill the hole. And so we'll have a couple of years probably where it's re drained um, and relatively dry where we may be able to get in there um, and uh, do some work. Now, part of the town of Searsville is not submerged. Um, it's just covered. <laughs> with poison oak and trees and brush and the Jasper Ridge courtyard and a lot of other stuff. Um, we, but um, I, I actually do think that we will be doing some more digging out there. As I said, we, we're trying to save everything we can. We found the Searsville school site. You know, I, I don't need, it doesn't need to be dug up for the project, but we're trying to get ready for those waterlogged um, uh, sediment buried sites too. I, I'm sure there will be ancestral Ohlone material um, there were a couple of Chinese laundries. We'd love to find those Chinese deposits um, and parts of the town of Searsville that, that were submerged. And so we're, we're excited about that, but that's very hard archaeology, I have to say. I'm sure. <clears throat> Sounds very uh, uh, yeah, forbidding. Um, is there a, either a website or some resource where the, the existing excavation sites that are located on Stanford property um, are listed, or is that something... No, it, you know, true. there's a state law that requires archaeological sites to be confidential. Oh. 
Okay. And the reason is that people show up with their metal detectors and their shovels, mm -hmm. or, or, or they show up, in, you know, relatively innocently, just mm -hmm. interested in helping their kid do a scout project. And so we can't publish those locations. Now, if you, if you come to Jasper Ridge on a tour, um, sometimes you can visit some of these sites because Jasper Ridge is really a very secure facility um, and we don't have looting inside Jasper Ridge. And so we feel more comfortable taking people to some of these heritage sites. Um, I, I say this, right? I, I, I can't give you a map, but there's archeology span everywhere, right? And um, uh, you know, if you pay attention to it, Santa Clara University has done some great interpretive work about their mission sites. There are archaeological sites you can visit in the Bay Area, um, and you know, and projects that you can learn about and and, and visit, and and that it's safe to visit because they're secure. It's unfortunate to hear about about the looting. Um, well, I think we have time for one last question, and that is, uh, how will the information that you are amassing be integrated into the Searsville Restoration Project? Well, we're, we're just submitting our inventory report about all the resources we found. Um, it's about 600 pages long. <laughs> but that's just the catalog of all this confidential information about the sites. Um, and then as, as, we, as the Army Corps of Engineers, right, and the, the Marine Fisheries people about the steelhead, as these agencies start to study Stanford's proposal, um, it, it, you know, we've done an excellent job, mostly because I'm a nag, at, at avoiding and minimizing impact to these archaeological resources. If I go to a meeting and there's seven engineers and six biologists, and there's me, and I'm relentless. Of, do, does it really need to be there? Can we really put the, can we move it over here? And so we have very limited impact on these resources from the project. Um, but the places where that might happen, there will be a lot of study. Um, and public meetings and consultation with tribal representatives and the state office of historic preservation and a, a great deal of discussion right about um, could we do could we do more to preserve these sites and I and I think that's really important and and there will be public meetings where it's discussed um, and I would encourage you to look up Searsville watershed restoration project and you can sign up for these public notices and public meetings and follow along and participate right as a citizen in making sure the things that you care about um, are protected and preserved. Back me up. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Laura. Uh, you know, I, this really has um, kind of brought to light to us how much, you know, history there is here, how much information. Uh, I know that there are people probably in our audience who are also really interested to know kind of what's the story, you know, after um, Stanford or, you know, once the dam was built. So, uh, we at the Historical Society are definitely looking into kind of a part two of this program or this presentation, um, which hopefully we can do next academic year. And as Laura mentioned, uh, you know, visiting Jasper Ridge and seeing some of these, um, these places with Laura or members of her team um, uh, would also uh, be something that I think uh, Historical Society members would be interested in. So we'll, we'll definitely look into organizing some of those um, for our members. Uh, well, on behalf of the Stanford Historical Society, thank you so much, Laura, uh, for taking the time to give us uh, this fascinating talk. Um, it really was just incredibly, um, uh, uh, yeah, fascinating uh, to see all of uh, what we kind of, I mean, see now as, as Stanford University and the campus and the land, um, but there's so much, uh, obviously, that predated it. Uh, thank you also to our audience for all your questions um, and for being with us today. Uh, to our members, again, your continued support makes what we do possible, and we're very grateful. Um, we will send out a survey by email in the coming days, uh, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, we really appreciate any feedback or comments you have about this program or ideas for future topics on Stanford history that appeal to you.